It is so hard to imagine our lives without computers these days. We use computers to connect to internet, to study, to play video games, to watch Netflix, <laughs> and if some time is left, to do some work. But computers are more than that. We use computers to design new airplanes. We use computers to forecast the weather. We use computers to study proteins and biomolecules. Heck, we even use computers to design new computers. Many of these applications require enormous computational power. That's why many universities, research labs, and government agencies invest in supercomputers. A supercomputer is basically many, many computers all connected together. In this picture, you're seeing an IBM Blue Gene P machine at Argonne National Lab in the States. It has over 250,000 processors. As a matter of fact, this is an old machine. Today, there is a new machine installed at the same lab which has over 750,000 processors. That's a really enormous amount of computational power. But even with such powerful machines, there are still many problems in engineering and science that we cannot actually solve them. Let me show you an example. There are literally thousands of flights to hundreds of destinations across the world every day. It would be very interesting for the CEO of an airline if he could optimize airplane schedules and routes to minimize, let's say, the fuel burn. It's good for the environment. It's good for actually the economy. In fact, there are billions of dollars worth of fuel which is just wasted because flight planning and schedules are not necessarily optimal. This graph shows the number of possible routes an aircraft can fly for a certain number of destinations. If you're interested to optimize the flight for 10 destinations, you have to check 10 to power 8 possibilities. On a normal computer at home, that takes about 30 milliseconds. That's pretty quick, pretty fast. So let's add a little bit more to it. So with 14 destinations, all of a sudden, the computational cost goes from 30 milliseconds to four hours and a half. For 18 destinations, it will take actually more than 11 centuries to find the optimal answer. For 28 destinations, it will take longer than the age of the universe as we know it today to find the answer. That just sounds crazy. That sounds unbelievable. But if you follow the curve, you'll see that actually the number of possibilities grows exponentially with the increasing number of destinations. This is not a unique problem. There are many problems, in fact, in cybersecurity, in biomedical sciences, and in resource management that have the same nature. That's why we cannot solve them on a computer that we have today. There is a massive race toward building a new technology called quantum computing. In quantum computing, we're going to use lots of quantum physics to obtain enormous computational speed so that we can tackle such problems. But before that, let's remind everybody that computers work on the premise of one and zero. Everything is transformed into these two binary numbers. In a classic computer, we basically do computations using tiny little bit of switches called transistors. A transistor is basically an electronic switch which has three parts. It has a source, it has a drain, and it has a gate. This switch is turned off when there is no electricity between the source and the drain. For example, this picture shows you a turned off switch. You turn on the switch by applying a voltage to the gate, and then there would be electricity going from the source to the drain. So you switched on this transistor. Basically, you switched one to zero or zero to one. This is how it works. If you connect a, a number of these transistors in a smart way together, you can do more complex computation with them. You can add numbers, you can subtract them, you can analyze pictures, you can do all things that we do with computers. That's how a classic computer works. The power of classic computers increases if you add more and more transistors to it. But it adds, actually, it adds up linearly. It means if you want to increase your, the, the power of your computer by a factor of two, you have to increase the number of bits in the computer by a factor of two. Well, quantum computing is a bit different. Imagine the simplest quantum system in the world. Maybe that's just an electron. 
You can imagine it to be a sphere. Quantum physics tells us that an electron can rotate around its axis. It can rotate around itself. So imagine that this electron is rotating counterclockwise around an axis which actually connects, connects its south pole to its north pole. We call this electron to be in the spin up state, and we're going to show it using an arrow. Well, the, the same electron can actually spin in the opposite direction. We'll say that the electron is in, is in the spin down state, and we'll show it with a downward arrow. So we have two states. Now I can associate one to be with one of the states, like a spin up, and zero with the other state. So what I just did, I built a bit out of quantum physics. We call them quantum bits or qubits. Well, just building a qubit is not fun by itself. You have to do operations on it. You have to switch a one into a zero and a zero into a one. We did that using transistors in classic computers. Well, in quantum physics, it's also doable. What you all have to do is just to rotate the electron by 180 degrees, and voila, you just switched the electron from one to zero. So a quantum computer can do whatever you can do with your classic computers. But it offers more than that. Actually, quantum physics offers more than that. So imagine an electron to be in the state um, a spin up, so, or one. And instead of rotating it by 180 degrees, I'm going to rotate it by 90 degrees. Then you might ask, is this qubit in zero or is it in one? Is it a spin up or is it a spin down? Well, here's the fun part. Quantum physics tells us that it's actually both. It is both zero and one. It's both on and off. Something you don't have in the classic world. A switch is either on or off. It cannot be both at the same time. But in quantum physics, you can have two conditions at the same time. That sounds a little rather peculiar, but that's true. That's what it can be. And this is why quantum computers are so powerful. Because you can encode two bits of information, one and zero, simultaneously into one qubit. You do the operation on one qubit, and you've, uh, you've done operation on two, on two classical bits, on both one and zero. If I add one more qubit to it, I can encode four bits of information and do operations on them. If I add another qubit, I can actually represent eight classical bits and do operations on them. In fact, if I have n qubits, I can operate on two to power n classical bits. That's why it's so powerful. So rather than actually increasing the number of bits in the computer by a factor of two to increase the speed, I can add one more qubit. That's all it takes. This graph shows a comparison between the power of a classical computer and a quantum computer when you increase the number of bits. And as you can see, the quantum, computer, the quantum computer's power grows way, way faster. That's why it's so powerful. As a matter of fact, with a, with a quantum computer having only 300 qubits, you get so much computation power more than all computers on Earth combined. Well, the nature has been kind to us with giving us quantum physics, but it hasn't been too kind. Because there's always some glitch, there's always some problem, and there's no free lunch. In fact, these quantum bits and qubits are very fragile. Any unwanted interaction with them, any noise in the system, can actually destroy their information. You prepare a qubit, let's say, to be in the spin up. You leave it there, you don't interact with it, but after a while, it will start to actually move and move and actually go to another state. If, if it's too much, you will lose all the useful information. Then we say the qubit has become decoherent, and it's one of the greatest problems that today we have. There have been multiple proposals about how to make a qubit or how to make a quantum computer. Uh, some are based on controlling an electron or even a proton inside the nucleus of an atom using big magnetic fields. 
other proposals depend on using photons and polarization of photons to make qubits. And some other proposals are based on nanoelectronics. But no matter what proposal you're pursuing, you have to satisfy a set of conditions. These conditions are put forward by one of the leading scientists in the field, Prof Professor David DiVincenzo. And that's why they're called DiVincenzo's criteria. The first condition is that the qubit or the system should be scalable. If you can make one qubit, you should be able to make two qubits, 10 qubits, 100 qubits, and 1,000 qubits, and put them all in one machine. If it takes a room like this to control one qubit, this is not a scalable system. We cannot put 10,000 of these qubits into one machine. The second condition is that we should be able to initialize the qubit. Well, that's uh, pretty obvious. The third condition is that we have to be able to do a set of operations on the qubit. The fourth condition, probably the most difficult one, is the qubit should remain coherent for many, many operations before it loses its information. And that's why um, it, it, it is very difficult and one of the maybe holy grails of quantum computing. And finally, you should be able to read the result from the qubit. These are the five bases that any scientific team tries to prove that their system has. Well, I'm gonna add another condition to this, and it has nothing to do with quantum physics, it has nothing to do with science, it has all to do with me being an engineer and actually doing business. And that is, oops. Okay. And that is, the technology should be realizable with existing, the quantum computer should be realizable with existing technologies. It means it shouldn't take 20 years for us to create new technologies to make the machine. Because it's very difficult to convince people in the private sector to invest in something which would pay off 20 years down the road. But if we start from existing technologies with things we have right now and try to build a quantum computer, we probably would have it in the next three to five years. And actually, I'm going to show you a very interesting proposal which meets all the conditions. And that's superconducting nanoelectronics. A superconductor is basically any material that shows zero resistivity against electricity. Some metals, like aluminum, when you cool them down to very low temperatures, they become superconductors. Well, although you can actually touch and feel a superconductor at a scale that you can hold in hand, it's important to note that superconductivity is actually a quantum phenomenon. It's indeed very paradoxic because we think quantum physics deals with things at an atom level or an electron level, but superconductors are indeed quantum phenomena. From high school physics, we know that if we take a piece of metal and connect it to a voltage source or a power source, we can induce a current inside it. Well, voltage and the current have a relation um, that current times the resistivity would be voltage. Now, if I take the resistivity and bring it down to zero, then the voltage required to induce that current becomes zero. In other words, if the metal becomes a superconductor, I don't need the voltage source. I can just remove it and connect the two ends of the superconductor, and I would have an electrical current going through the system. Now, Look at this system. This is a real qubit made from superconductors. Look at the ring inside, the, the inner one, the, uh, the inner ring. So we said that without the voltage source, we can have an electrical cur current going through it. If the current is circulating in the counterclockwise direction, we can actually associate it like being an electron in the spin-up direction or being in the state one. Uh, and similarly, if, it's if the electrical current is circulating in the clockwise direction, it can be in a state zero. That's the, that's the way that you can make an artificial electron. It's not a real electron. It's a circuit that mimics electronic behavior. And in fact, it has quantum effects. You can put it in superposition. You can put both one and zero on top of each other. And this is a very interesting proposal. In fact, we, it also meets my condition. We can use all the well-established nanoelectronics technique in the world, like electrobeam lithography, to etch one of these circuits on a wafer. Then you mount it on a cryostat, 
which is basically a giant refrigerator, and you put it in a liquid helium and cool it down to very low temperatures. The operating condition is about 10 millikelvin, just 10 milli-degrees above absolute zero. That's very cool. And it's expensive and hard to do, but it's possible to do it. In fact, even last month, there were proposals and there were results, very encouraging results, from two uh, scientific groups in Google and IBM who are getting very encouraging results. Maybe I'll finish with a few words about my role in all of this. And that's, I do simulations. I, I make softwares that you can engineer these things. And um, I hope that you will stay tuned as in the next three to five years, hopefully, we'll bring you a new revolution in computing. Thank you very much.